taught. For those of you who, for some reason, don't know T-Bone Burmette, I will give you just a very brief background. Um, he's an artist, songwriter, producer, performer, concert producer, record company owner, and artist advocate. Uh, he's got 10 solo records since his solo debut, Truth Decay, came out in 1980. Among some of his Grammy Awards are uh, producing credits for Raising Sand, Robert Plant and Alison Krauss, B.B. King's One Kind Favor, the platinum soundtrack to the Johnny Cash biopic, Walk the Line, the, Plantum, the platinum Tony Bennett, Katie Lang duets album, A Wonderful World, the eight times platinum release, Oh Brother, We're Out There, which also spawned two highly successful national concert tours. His film work includes uh, Academy Award nominations and awards for original songs, The Weary Kind for Crazy Heart and The Scarlet Tide from Cold Mountain. His current projects include uh, Elton John and Leon Russell and a Greg Allman project, follow-up albums for John Mellencamp, uh, collaborating with Mellencamp and author Stephen King on Ghost Brothers of Darkland County, which is a play with music set in the fictional town of Lake Belle Reve in Mississippi. And uh, he's about to embark on a very brief tour, which will take him to uh, Boston and uh, New York later on this month, which I'm sure he'll tell you a little bit about. He's going to be in conversation with Greg Cott, uh, an old-time future of music friend. He's the music critic at the Chicago Tribune. He's the co-host of the nationally syndicated Sound Opinions. And his most recent book is Ripped, How the Wired Generation Revolutionized Music. Please give a warm welcome. Thanks. Is your mic working? Mic check. You're the engineer. So we, uh, you know, backstage you're supposed to talk about what you're going to talk about, but everybody just wanted to talk about the Big Lebowski with T-Bone. So <laughs> we're going to spend the next half an hour just talking about that movie. Uh, the resume is, is huge, obviously, but um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're, we're, we're going to be talking about the future here as opposed to dwelling on the past. That's right. Well, that's right. It's the, the T-Bone Burnett panel, so you can talk about whatever you want. But, okay. Um, um, let's get it started, because I, I think the, the big question at uh, Future of Music always um, has been one of these issues of, okay, we're moving into this future. Business technology is changing in a way um, over the last 10 years that we could never have imagined uh, in the way it relates to the arts, especially the production of intellectual property that can be digitized. Um, the big, the big question is, how do people get paid in this environment, okay? How do artists get paid? Should they even get paid? Are we wasting a lot of time trying to figure out how artists should get paid for recorded music, or is that horse already left the barn, and should we be looking at other ways for artists to be compensated other than for, for recorded music? Well, <clears throat> in my view, you know, tech, technology changes every 10 or 15 years. Um, in my view, the future of recorded music is analog. Digital doesn't read music. The digital medium is great for a, it's a great word processor, but it's, it's a, you know, it's a binary is always a sharp point and light is in waves and music is in waves. And as soon as you, as you translate it into digital, you translate it into squares or, or steps. So <clears throat> we're, we, me and my friends are looking for new analog storage media. And, uh, and I believe there are a lot of interesting, uh, inter I think there's a really interesting future in recorded music. I think, I, I view the internet as a, as a broadcast medium myself. MP, you know, MP, well, let me say this, the, the internet in general, YouTube in particular, and, and a lot of the other platforms are amateur uh, platforms. You know, YouTube is a platform for people to put out low, uh, low bit rate files to, of, 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 you know, things they've done in their families or, you know, think, you know, that's, that's the primary use for it. It's more, it's almost like a social network with, pic, with, with you know, moving pictures. But the re it's, it's shocking to me that the, the professional musicians, and, 
And I, and I don't call myself a professional musician, and I don't believe I have a career either. But it's shocking that people, people who are serious about recorded music have submitted to allowing their work to be distributed primarily on such a degraded medium as an MP3. It's shocking. You know, so in my view, MP3 should be given away. I think they should be given away, you know, because I don't think they're worth anything. So, you know, so I view the internet as a broadcast medium. I think there has to be a digital music license like the broadcast music license was. In 1926, when radio proliferated in the places where there, were, there was electricity, the record business fell off 80% in one year. By 1931, it was off 95%. But the, the publishers at the time were able to persuade the broadcasters to share their advertising revenue with them. So the radio played music for free and sold advertising. Google plays music for free and sells advertising. So it's necessary for new media to share with old media. And, and it's necessary for old media to become new media. Mm -hmm. Well, the, Paul McGinnis, the manager of U2, uh, has said, has called internet service providers basically high-tech burglary kits. They've created these high-tech burglary kits, the iPods, the you know, internet service providers. Uh, they are using music in order to you know, build their businesses. That's true. They should be giving some of it back. They should. Um, but this opens up a can of worms. Let's say we, we, we talk about uh, collecting fees for, for musicians, for recorded music that is uh, exchanged on the internet. You know, then the movie industry is going to want in. Then the publishing industry is going to want in. Yeah. You know, um, where does that end? Is that a viable well, solution to this? Well, you know, there's, look, here's, here's an interesting fact. You know, the 10% of the cable, the capacity of the cable television universe at any moment of the day would completely take up the entire capacity of the internet. You know, the internet's been presented to us like it's this inevitable thing, this cloud around us that's going to, you know, that's going to uh, mediate our every, our every interaction. But it's not. You know, it's just a new technology and it will be replaced in the not too distant future. The internet is not, the, the internet is, it's a good thing, it's an okay thing, but it's not the, it's not the, you know, the internet, I was a follower of Teilhard de Chardin when I was a kid, and, um, and he was the person who said that the electronic universe was an extension of our nervous systems, and that through the, through the growth of the electronic universe, we would all be knitted together uh, uh, into this, until we reach this omega point, this godhead. And there's a lot about, excuse me, there's a lot about the, the hype, if you'll forgive my <laughs> word, of the internet that, uh, that grows out of that. that there, there's some notion of that, that we're all going to be socially networked together and we're going to enter this omega point where there's peace in the world and, um, and the lion will lay down with the lamb. But <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I just view it as another tool. It's a fantastic tool. My, my, one of my mentors, a guy named Johnny Stroud, in, in 1980-something, when he was hooking up the internet at the University of British Columbia, said, this is the most powerful communication tool in the history of man, and in 20 years, people will be using it like a toy. You know? which is pretty much where, where we are now, you know. Well, I think there's also been this sort of built up, uh, you know, when you talk about hype, there's been built up a hype about the cost of recording music. You know, you go into a studio like Ocean Way, you know, you're talking about a big bucks overhead, you're talking about, you know, the best sound that money can buy, right? Um, I know you've, you've recorded albums on some on very different circumstances for all sorts of budgets. What's the reality of, you know, can somebody make a record, a great record in their bedroom? Yeah, you can make a great record if, you know, if the, if the cat's singing a song great, you, somebody can be dropping a bag of rocks behind him and it'll be a great record. You know, it doesn't, it's all about the singer and the song and then the, everything else is scoring that. You know, I, I do a lot of movie stuff and, 
and you know we so you score the scene you score the libretto you score the you you, pre, you provide the emotional underpinning and backdrop for the thing but you know the it's McLuhan said, McLuhan said, a medium surrounds, a new medium surrounds an old medium and turns the first medium into an art form, as television did with film, and as the internet has now done with television. Television is in a, in a golden age. There's no, you know, you can, television, in fact, is a much more vital art form than, than film at the moment. But television, is, I mean, the internet's also surrounded recorded music and turned recorded music into an art form. So my view is, you know, if you want to let, if you want to let the, uh, your music be distributed in this horrible, degraded format that's actually bad for people to hear, don't sell it to them or sell it to them for a penny or something, you know. To, you know but make beautiful, hard, hard copies of the, if you're doing serious work. Do it, you know, do it with your whole heart and do it. You know, Barnett Newman said the artist's job is, to, is it, Barnett Newman said, time washes over the tip of the pyramid. And what he was saying by that was that there's a lot of room on the bottom of the pyramid to place things. But if you put something on the very top, time washes over it. If you put things on the bottom, time washes it right down into the sand. But, but at the top, there's a tension that keeps it there. That's really, that's an artist's job. And that music is an art, and if music, if, as music's going to survive, it's going to survive by people putting it on the tip of the pyramid. And, and you know, I think in order to do that, we have to look for the strongest, strongest, sorry, storage media we can find, the most permanent. The, the library needs to be future-proofed. The, the record company, I've been fighting record companies for 40 years, you know, hard, and, and it, it hadn't been fun. They were a, they were a, brutal bunch. Let me just say though, you know, at least they would ask you what picture you wanted on your album cover, which, you know, Google or YouTube or none of those people do. The the record companies have much as bad as the artist relationships the artist relations have been with the, from the record companies, much worse from the internet. Much much worse. No regard for the artists whatsoever from the internet. So uh, I'm, I may be, I'm maybe you're, you're rolling, man. You're no. good. You're good. You're doing good. <laughs> um, there's a lot of wisdom in there. And I, one of the, again, one of the big topics that comes up uh, at these conferences con continually is this artist fan relationship, how important that is. And we've got all sorts, it's sorts the key of social to the whole, networks. It's the key yeah. to the whole thing. But social, you know, look, the, 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 this is the problem. The, the two things are wrong with the record companies they've alienated the artists and they've alienated the audience and that relationship has to be mitigated somehow that has that man, that relationship has to be managed artists cannot manage that relationship an art a musician has to be making art a musician can't be studying data a musician can't be analyzing data a musician can't be doing public you know setting up publicity a mu musician you know there there are too many things there are too many a, key, a musician can't run a back room a musician can't run a marketing campaign a musician has to be playing music we need infrastructure around us we need help the record companies have uh, discredited themselves very badly the internet's worse lady gaga has over 220 million hits on one video on YouTube. She's made under 10 million, uh, under $10,000 streaming video last year. From 220 million hits, she made under $10,000. Do not look to the internet to help you. It's not going to. They don't care. They're building their own businesses, you know? So these artists who are concentrating now on Twittering, Facebooking, you know, my spacing, keeping in touch with the fans, creating this relationship with their fans in order to sort of develop a devoted fan base. Are they wasting their time doing that? No, no, they're not. No, but it has to be, you know, the, the new, we're in an interregnum right now. An interregnum, for those who don't know the word, is a, it's a period of time when the old has not died and the new has not yet been born. And so we're in that brackish water where the river meets the ocean and the salt water and the fresh water get mixed up, you know. But... There has, there has to be a relationship with the fans, and there has to be a certain distance from the fans, too. You can't, you can't go live at the fans' house, you know. They, 
they won't like it for long. They may think it's fantastic for the first three days, and then they'll be thinking, like, how do I get this guy out of here? All he does is eat all my food and play music all day. Stop playing that music, please. You, you, you've had a, uh, in terms of dealing with these rather large, uh, awkward businesses, uh, from Hollywood to the major record labels, you've man managed to sneak in an awful lot of uh, art, for God's sakes. Um, quirky records, strange records, records that had no right to be released on these, through these major corporations. Uh, even at the, at the height of, uh, let's get Led Zeppelin together and make a gazillion dollars, uh, you go into the studio with him and Alison Krauss and make a record that neither of those two ever would have made on their own, probably. Um, and it ended up being a bestseller and winning Grammy Awards, etc. You made a brother. You made Oh Brother Where Art Thou with the soundtrack for that, where essentially you were, uh, uh, you know, uh, pre rock and roll music uh, on a soundtrack that ends up becoming one of the best selling records of all time. Um, how do you explain your ability to sort of negotiate this extreme, for lack of a better term, weirdness in the midst of this very narrow minded kind of thinking? In these corporations. I spend every moment of my day, all I think about is trying to put something on the tip of the pyramid. That's all I think about. I don't think about selling somebody a t-shirt, you know? you know? I think about how good can I make it? What's the best thing I can do? And if you make something good enough, all of that stuff takes care of itself. You know, there'll be deli different delivery systems. There'll be, there's a huge disruption in our distribution chain right now, and it's got everybody flipped out. That'll be resolved eventually, and I'm here to help resolve it. I mean, I want to help. I'm, I'm attending conferences. I'm talking to people. I'm trying to bring people together to say, you know, the, the, if, we, if we behave ethically, we can get through this dislocation. There will, be, there will be new means of distribution. But I don't care what the means of distribution is. I'm going to do the best thing I can. And, and the distributors will either get it or they won't. I've, I've had a lot more quirky things not get distributed well. But occasionally they will. And if, in that one, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou just happened to be really good. That, that was a lot of good people you know, do, doing really good work. Mm -hmm. Well, so the key is, at, at, at a space, if you're telling a new artist today, some 20-year-old artist is starting out making music and saying, you know, I really want to do this, um, the first thing you tell them, obviously, A, put all your heart and soul into, that, into the art. Everything else is, doesn't matter, or Secondary. how much does no, it matter? No, it's not that it, it matters a lot, but, but you've got to get that right first. What, what, what good is it to sell a lot of something that's not great, you know? In the, one of the oldest, one of the things people back in the old days were most afraid of is record companies would put out the worst song on the album as a single, and then you'd be afraid it would be a hit, and then you'd have to sing it the rest of your life. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, and we know a few of those. Um, <laughs> talk about gatekeepers for a minute. Um, you know, it used to be radio program directors, used to be MTV, used to be uh, you know a few glossy magazines. Now, you know, we've got. Uh, statistics are there were well over 100,000 officially sound scanned records that uh, were released a year ago. Probably three times that many that didn't have anything to do with the sound scan world. That's a lot of music out there to be processed to, for, to get out to people. How do you, are gatekeepers A, necessary in that world? And who are they if, if well, they are? Let me tell you this, let me just put it this way. I was with Zahava Levine, who's the general counsel of Google and YouTube two days ago. Now, I may not have the statistic right, so Zahava, if I don't, my apologies. But when, when, I, told, when I gave her that, that fact that 10% of the capacity of cable television would completely take up the total capacity of the internet at any moment, she said, well, we upload 24 million uh, videos an hour or a day or something like that to, to, to say how could you possibly be right. Well, so who's going to watch 24 million videos, you know? How does that get done? And does anybody really want to watch 24 million? But personally, I'm, I'm old, I'm 62, you know? And I used to hate critics. Now I kind of think, they, they, they were pretty nice guys, actually. You know, they're, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I think, no, I, I think we do need filters. I, you know, I think all of it's good. I think all of the, the uh, you know, if you go to you, 
Yoohoo, Yahoo, and you search something and it comes up like who's trending, you know, that's good, I, great, these people are trending, these are the top 10, you know, like whoever they are. Like people, you wouldn't even, why is this person trending right now, but there they are. That's great, you know, that's good. I, the, um, but I, I think it's good to have smart people say, you know, this is good. If, if, I, told you, if I told you that there's a record that's really great uh, that you should listen to, you'd probably think, hmm, maybe I ought to listen to that, you know, because, because I've done this for 40 years and I've built up some modicum of, uh, you know, a reputation for integrity or something. So I think that's, I think, I think yes, filters and gatekeepers are, are an import, important part of it. I think gatekeepers can be really brutal and horrible, too. I suffered under some gatekeepers in my <laughs> life as well, you know. You, you don't even remember this, but you did write me a letter once uh, about, about I did. 20 years ago after I a review that I wrote. Yeah, yeah he wrote, Greg wrote a bad review of one of my bad shows. <laughs> And I, <laughs> and I wrote him back and said, well done, you know. <laughs> That's true, you did. It was the nicest letter I got from somebody from a bad, for a bad review. Um, but uh, anyway, that, now I'm totally, now, now I'm all wait, starry. Wait, I, but we're going back. You were asking me about young people. If, I, I want to yeah. go back to that. All of that stuff, n none of it's a waste of time. Well, it's a wa if, it's, if it's causing you not to write music or to play music, then yes, it's a waste of time. But... You know, I believe every bit of the technology is useful in the area that it's in which it's useful. You know, but oh, now I've, I've lost it anyway. Let's well, keep going. You know, I, I wanted to get you know. Oh, here's what I was going to say. If I were if I were starting off right now, knowing what I know right now, I would say, don't put your music on the internet. That's what I would say. Really? Yeah. I would say stay completely away from the internet. Have nothing to do with it. Don't be on Facebook. Don't be on MySpace. You know why? Because as soon as you're on MySpace, you're one of six million, you know? And, you know, if, and, and when I say, you know, when people ask me about, like, how do you make a commercial record or, or the kind of the question you asked a minute ago, you know, if you want to go down the middle, then the line forms on the right, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. You know? I say if you if you want to do if you want to if you're a musician today and you want to make and you want to record music and you want to circulate that recorded music don't put it on the internet because you're degrading the thing that you're doing to such a low point as it's reduced its value to zero in the last 30 years the United States has decided has attempted to to redesign itself as a knowledge society and in that 30 years, we've reduced the value of our knowledge to zero. We've exported all of our manufacturing jobs to, to the east. We've, we're exporting all of our intellectual property to the east. And it's getting sold back to us, and we're getting paid nothing for it. So why would you want to do that? You know, it's not, and by the way, this isn't, just, this isn't just a musician issue. It's a trade issue. It's an issue of whether we in the United States are going to survive as a culture. And as a society, you know, because if we can't enumerate our rights, if we can't spell out our rights very plainly in this country, then the rest of the world is not going to respect them. And they're not right now, you know. And the trade imbalance is going so, is, is sliding east so heavily that we're all going to be out of business if we don't get, if we don't get this together. Mm -hmm. Again, though, we're talking about a box, that, that PC, that, that, that cell phone, you know, supposedly the greatest distribution uh, device known to man in terms of spreading the music around. Uh, you're, you're telling artists, Radio's just, so what? What's the difference if, it, if it's all coming down from a cloud or it's being broadcast from a tower? Who cares? The radio gave you much way better quality. Analog television still better quality than digital. Television. Yeah, but a lot of people were playing those radios through crappy sound systems on a car yeah, dashboard, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah, the right. sound was degraded then too. No, right. It's all, it, yeah, of course, of course you're right. But a transistor radio sounds from 1950 sounds better than an iPod does today, you know. And with apologies to Steve Jobs, you know, who's a great American, and I love Steve. So, but that's just that's man. You know, I listen. I listen. Here's another thing I just learned. I've been working with Dolby, the cats at Dolby. You know, we don't listen with our ears. We listen with our intelligences. You know, we listen with our spirits. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, okay. Keep. 
No, that's good. That's good stuff. I was just going to say, re regarding the, the amateur medium, the whole, the whole of the Internet's an amateur medium. It's amateur journalists. And that's, <laughs> you know, there's nothing wrong with amateurs, by the way. Amateur comes from the root amo, you know, the amo <clears throat> masamat, the Latin, you know, which means love. So it's people who do, do it because they love it. And people put things, they put pictures of their cats on YouTube because they love it. But it's an amateur medium, and they're amateur journalists. They're amateur, there are millions and millions of amateur musicians. But, and, and for an amateur musician, who cares if it's an MP3? You know, It's fine. That's a fine transmission medium. But if you're a serious musician, if you spend $250,000 on a violin, why in the world would you allow it to be recorded and come through uh, the equivalent of the speaker on a Hallmark card? It's, it's insanity, you guys. What about, um, so, okay, you're, you're saying stay off the internet. So that 20-year-old artist That's one is saying, okay, T-Bone told me to stay off the internet. I'm not going to open my MySpace account. I'm not going to Twitter. I am not going on Facebook. How do I get my music out to the world? How do I let the world know that I exist? How is the world going to find out about me? Well, you know, so, you know, the, none of the other media are going away. There was a, the, among the, you know, the, that, that, that world I was talking about growing out of Teilhard where we're all going to, where we're all going to be uh, united into, uh, you know, a godhead, into the Omega Point. I call that itopia, you know. Thomas More coined the word utopia out of two Greek words, eutopia, which meant a good place, and outopia, which means a place that doesn't exist. And so he, I believe he was saying that, that this place he was writing about was in, in that tension. I also think itopia was this notion that we were all going to be, we were all going to be swept into this uh, digital cloud and the analog world was going to disappear and we were all going to be, uh, you know, uh, united in this, in this electrical, electronic universe. Which sounds very much like the Matrix, you know, right? It, that's true. But, it doesn't but, sound very pleasant. It doesn't sound pleasant, but, you know, that's, but it sounds better than a lot of what's going on down here. So, I, you know, but I'm sorry, I forgot the question. So, you're not on MySpace. You're not on Twitter. Oh, so not, none of these other media, none of these other formats, it's, none of it's going away, you know? Jack White's now putting out seven inches and ten inches with seven inches. You know, be imaginative. If you're an artist, be an artist. Don't like take somebody else's technology and think that's going to make your art better. I think deep down, every person who gets into this is thinking, I want it. Like Jill Sobiel was up here earlier and saying, I, I'm just so glad I don't have to work a straight job. You know, I mean, that's that I'm, I'm making a living off my art somehow, some way. And I think every artist who creates stuff, you know, wants to have that life where it's like, I don't have to work at the, uh, I don't have to be a waiter or a waitress, you know, well, to make, to pay the bills. I want to make, I want to pay the bills from my art. Well, you know, Rousseau and T.S. Eliot were bankers, you know, there's no, there's no, no one way it works. Some people are better off, we're, you know, doing jobs and keeping their art pure, keeping it away from uh, the economy, you know. It's, I just don't think there's any one way to do it. Uh, the, you know, I, th I think the, the the thing we have to focus on is is how well do we see, how well do we hear, how beautiful can we make something, how challenging, how can we advance things, you know, how can we not just repeat the thing that's been repeated a thousand times? I don't, for one thing, I don't believe in the post-modern world. Oh, ten minutes. I don't believe in the post-modern world. I, I, you know, I, I believe we're in, we're in the modern world. We're still in the modern world. And even though, you know, uh, Lady Gaga is a type of Madonna who was a type of Bette Midler, you know, and, you know, there, there are these things, there are these repetitions of images and, and functions within the culture that repeat. I don't think we're trapped in that. It, we're, we're not, this isn't inevitable. None of it's inevitable. You know, the, the great, to me, since we've got 10 minutes left, to me, the, the, challenge of our time greater than terrorism probably as great as uh, and maybe greater than climate change is whether we're going to control the machines or they're going to control us you know 
Earthquakes happen here and here. Terrorism happens there. The machines are marching forward like this over us. We were coming over here today, or we were driving around this morning, and uh, you know, my friend was uh, was on the navigation system, and he said it's amazing how uh, you know I, I don't know how, where to go anymore. I have to watch the navigation. I have to, the machine has to tell me where to turn. I can't even, you know, we can't remember phone numbers anymore. The machines tell us what music we're going to like. They tell us what girl we're going to go out with, you know, right? If they can tell us that, they can tell us what God to worship, and they can tell us when to lay down and die, you know? Does anybody got a question for T-Bone? I dare you. We got a microphone, by the way, so everybody can hear. Thank you. We got one. Hold on to the microphone. While we're waiting. By the way, one I'm the happiest person in the world. I want you all to know that. Grateful, deeply grateful, seriously. That's okay, I, got I um, ag agree that the MP3 is a degraded format, but I, I don't think that it means as much to the average college student as it means to you or other musicians. I know there have been studies that show that college students prefer MP3s to other formats because they, the sound sizzles to them. Um, I was curious, you started out saying that you're looking at other forms of analog distribution. Do you have anything you can share? And how do you think that's, if, you know, if there's an extra cost, the premium formats, DVD, audio, SACD, fail because there's not enough interest in that quality. Well, you know, I, I, that's anecdotal. You know, the, 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 uh, the reality is we can get, get water out of the tap all day long and yet we'll pay for Fuji water or something, you know. <clears throat> we had free TV and yet we were willing to pay for cable TV. So it's always an issue of quality. Quality, quality is, the, is the issue that moves us from one, from one place to another. And the college students, if that's what they've got now and that's what they want, then more power to them. They've got them. There's no shortage of them, you know. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> excuse me, art's not for everybody, you know. And what, and what I'm doing, I don't, you know, the mass age is over. The other thing McLuhan said, you know, is the medium is the mass age. Mass age is over. It's all niches now. So if you're a new artist, you're going to have to find a niche. And you're going to have to explore that niche. If it's at a college, you can, play at the, you can play at the college. And you can make a record for X amount of dollars. Here's one other thing I want to say. The, the biggest problem the record industry faces right now is that they have gotten stuck under a price structure that allows no innovation. So it's a $10, that's 10 bucks, that's all you can pay, and there's no, there's no way to do anything else in there besides the, th the very thing they're doing, put out CDs, you know. So that has to, first of all, that, that roof has to be blown off the thing, you know. The price has to change completely. That's why I say make MP3s for free, you know, and then sell other things. Sell, you know, go to their house, you, you, I mean, you know what I mean? Sell them a record and cook them a meal. You, you, there's 80, you know, I could sit here for s seven years and give you other ideas of, of ways to personalize the experience in a much more profound way than a social net, uh, you know, an internet social network. You could write a letter as part of it, you know, with your signature on it, your hand. Tashin Books is really interesting. Tashin will sell a book for $75,000. He'll put a drop of the artist's blood in the paper that it's made from, you know? <laughs> There's a guy in Chicago that wrote a song for everybody that bought his record. So, like, if the guy bought, if you bought his record, he would tag on an extra song yeah. onto the CD that was written for you, especially if you wrote a little bio to him. He'd write the song for you. Yeah. That's a not, lot of work, though. Not as easy for, like, you know, Michael Jackson yeah. or somebody. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> Innovative marketing. Uh, Double-edged sword, though. Yeah, I just want to actually object. I'm a college student who actually... Uh, I'm a college student uh, from the University of Maryland, and I'm representing the uh, University of Maryland Terrapin Sound Magazine. And I'm actually a student who despises MP3s. I'm one of the few people I know that actually has a record player in my room. And I try to raise conscious to, consciousness to my friends that MP3s aren't accurate in terms of sound, like you were saying, the physics of the waves, as well as uh, listening to a record actually gives you a complete experience of understanding the artist and the message, you know, so on and so forth. So would you give like, any words of advice to how to like, raise this awareness instead well, of when people look at me as a VCR in a DVD world? Well, you know, the, the, 
I, I believe there's a generation uh, who came of age before the internet and who, who the internet came to at a young age, who it was like, you know, in the old movies where you would show the mirror to the native and, and you know, they were like, whoa. And then, and then, then there's the people that came up under them where you are who grew up with the internet. So the internet's just like, when I was growing up, we had the telephone, you know. The internet's another version of the telephone. Now, we were all, like the telephone, you mean I can talk to somebody, you know, you know what I mean? So I think, I think if, if you want to raise awareness, you can write about it, you can study about it, you can have people over and play them a record. I know when I have people over and, and do a demonstration of, okay, here's what, you know, the Beatles, here's a really good demonstration. The Beatles were digitized in 1987, I think, and for 20, and it was the worst digitization in history. There was, and that was the Beatles, and it's, it, the Beatles CDs that were listened to for 20 years are completely unlistenable. And I went on, I went on eBay, and I bought a reel-to-reel, -reel, a seven and a half inch reel-to-reel, -reel, quarter inch tape of the Beatles. And I, and I lined them up in Pro Tools in 2496 high bit. And I said, OK, here is, here is the CD, and here is a tape, you know? And the people go, turn that CD off, you know? Because it's, it's painful. It's, digital sound is, is painful. In high, in high resolution, it's less painful. And we're, we've been working, I've, I've been working with my, I've got a group of engineers and, who are working to make uh, digital sound more resonant, you know. But did you, you know, <clears throat> as soon as they went to CDs, CDs cut off everything at 22,000 cycles. I can, I, can, I can have a program, a full range program, and walking around the world, we hear up to 80,000 cycles. In rainforest, you hear over 100,000 cycles. When you cut it off at 20,000, you're cutting off 75% of what's been of what you normally hear when you in mp3 you're probably hearing about 10% of what you're actually hearing so but if I take an equalizer and I add 4 dB at 30,000 cycles you'll hear it it'll be brighter because it's not just up there where they say you can't hear it's every octave coming down all the way to 10,000 to 5,000 so you know the 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 experience, the, the 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 experience that people are having with music is is <clears throat> since the CD has been very badly degraded, and all of us need to fight to get past the idea of any kind of compressed or low definition audio for music. Films, television, and video games put out music at a higher resolution than the mu than the music business does. That's insane. Stupid. Any, anybody too. else? We got we got one down here. Can you talk about working with um, younger artists like Ryan Bingham? Yeah. Oh, will I talk about working with younger artists? I'm working with an incre one of the great things about the proliferation of music through the internet is that when I was a kid, if you found a Skip James record. It was like finding an amulet, you know? It was like finding a key to another dimension or something. Now that's available <clears throat> to everybody 24 hours a day. It's a, that is an amazing, fantastic thing, the fact that we, we have this library that's available to us. The fact that the library is almost unlistenable is a problem. <laughs> but, and, the, and the fact that they are throwing out a lot of the old original sources because they feel they've been digitized, you know. <clears throat> Whereas technology every 10 or 15 years is going to completely roll over, you know. So whatever you digitized in 87 is completely outmoded by, nine, you know, 2000. But, but I, I have found that the young musicians, I just did a show in San Francisco with the Punch Brothers and Karen Elson and the Secret Sisters. And they're all motherfuckers, man. I'm telling you, these punch brothers are stone motherfuckers. I, you know, and how do they do that? But it's because they had access to the library, you know. So that, that's a beautiful thing. And I find that they're better, the, the young musicians are better than we were, you know, way better. Uh, they're, they're, uh, 
They have more facility. They have a, a, a broader view of things. Uh, they, they have a keener way of looking into things because they have the advantage of all of this other stuff that's come before them, you know, so I, You've just mentioned three bands, and, you know, he was asking about Ryan Bingham, so four. Everybody in this room can, can you know, immediately hear a piece of music by those four artists. If you had mentioned four similarly young, new, <laughs> relatively unformed artists 20 years ago, they would have been... It could have taken some of them six months to find those those well, probably that not, music but, in a record store. Well, no, Ryan Bingham's in the record store. Oh, yeah. Secret Sisters will be in this record store next week. Okay. Punch Brothers are in the record store now. The one copy sold out, and you go there, and you, they got order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, look, there, there are... Well, there was a... T yeah. There, there's no right way. Look, I'm not here to defend the record business or, or that method of distribution, you know. The, um, but there's something to be said about... Maybe even just the advertisement of that MP3 is a way of hearing the yeah, music yeah. and maybe good, opening up a doorway. Yeah, to it's something, a great advertisement. It's a great. That's what I'm saying. The internet's a broadcast medium, and yeah. it should be. It should be. You know, first of all, any of you musicians out there who use the word monetized, shame on you. You know. <laughs> 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 Secondly, you know, if you want to monetize. <laughs> MP3s, you should do it at a super low price point. But actually, MP3s, the whole internet should be should be on some should be on a blanket license. Then there should be different levels of of listening experiences that are available to you. Right now, not right now. The problem is if you want to hear any of those people or, or many of these people, you can get an MP3. You can maybe get a CD, both degraded mediums. What, what else, you know? Well, you, I mean, some of them are putting out the vinyl. I mean, it's, that, well, that's, then, that's, that's where uh, you can get the real experience that you're talking about, right? Yeah, so why are we selling MP3s and CDs? Why, why did we get stuck on CDs? That, that was a ridiculous... Well, you said something a few minutes ago that kind of made me kind of my heart jump because you said maybe, this, maybe that just not that many people are interested in art and you probably have, have a point. But the convenience and portability have obviously trumped the fidelity of the for sound while, and the quality of you know, the sound. For a while, you know. I mean, it, it's not inevitable. We're not on this railroad track on a, on, you know, that we have to keep going this direction. We can stop, we can go over this track, you know. We can change. We're, we're smart and we're reasonable and we can think th things through. Every, I bet everybody here wants musicians to get paid. Oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was, he was just he's teasing. Come on, finish that thought. Everybody uh, here wants musicians to get paid, which is I think everybody does. Google does. Steve Jobs does. Yeah. YouTube does. Everybody wants musicians to get paid. There needs there need to be mechanisms to do that. But the musicians have to make great music, you know. Mm -hmm. Great music. Okay, that's a good way to end it. Thanks, T Bone. Thanks, you guys. Bye.